Hello, everyone, and welcome to the Shades of Entrepreneurship. This is your host, Mr. Gabriel Flores. Today, I welcome a guest from the cannabis industry with experiences in mergers and acquisitions, which got me thinking about M&A. What is it? Why is it important? And why should an entrepreneur care? Mergers and acquisitions, also known as M&A, is a term commonly used to describe a consolidation of companies or assets through different types of financial transactions. Now, although these terms are used interchangeably at times, they do have different meanings. First, mergers. One of the best examples is Disney merging with then Steve Jobs' own Pixar back in 2006 by acquiring $2.7 billion worth of Pixar shares, making Pixar a subsidiary of the Walt Disney Company. A subsidiary is a company that belongs to another company, kind of how Skype and LinkedIn are owned by Microsoft. They are subsidiaries while Microsoft is the parent company. In the Pixar Disney example, Walt Disney is the parent company and Pixar is the subsidiary. Taking it a step further, Disney and Pixar recently merged with Marvel Entertainment, and I am sure a lot of us have seen a movie or two or even at least a promotion of a Marvel Disney movie. Note in these examples, each company keeps the brand. Pixar, Marvel. In fact, Disney is merging with these brands to leverage and use the company's brand equity. Brand equity is the commercial value that derives from the consumer's perspective of the brand name of a particular product or service, rather than the product or service itself. Now, I am sure a lot more went into Disney's decision to merge with Pixar and Marvel, but even in unprofitable companies have value brand equity. A great example of a non-profitable company with brand equity is AMC Entertainment Group. Now, I am not bashing on the apes. Do your thing. Let me state I am not a financial advisor, but I am concerned retail investors are dumping their money into a brand that has $5.5 billion in interest-bearing debt on the company's balance sheet. AMC generated roughly $230 million in interest expenses the first quarter of their 2021 fiscal year. That is almost $480 million annually. AMC has never made over $310 million in operating income in the past 10 years, according to the Monty Fool. That is not a profitable company. Okay, back to M&As. Acquisitions, unlike merger, is when a company acquires another company. A good example of an acquisition, and one I happen to study often in grad school, is Amazon's acquisition of Whole Foods in 2007. Amazon purchased Whole Foods for $13.7 billion. That acquisition allowed Amazon to access over 460 stores that could serve as beachheads for in-store pickup and distribution network, according to the Wall Street Journal at the time of the acquisition. Wait a minute. Amazon is an online retail store. Why would they want a grocery store? Well, it is part of their long-term strategy. Although I cannot say for certain what that strategy may be, Amazon gave us a hint in 2007 when they stated, Amazon views groceries as one of the most important long-term drivers of growth in its retail segment. The acquisition of Whole Foods allows Amazon to break into that market without the years of building out their brick and mortar retailing. When I don't have milk, I go to the market and I buy milk. Similar to that, Although on a much larger scale and at a much different market, Amazon didn't have a grocery store. So they went out to the market and bought a grocery store. Now there are four types of M&A that I'll briefly define. Horizontal mergers and acquisitions happen when companies with similar products or service come together with a main goal to expand their offerings or markets. Like if Pepsi and Coke came together, that would be considered a horizontal M&A. Vertical mergers and acquisitions happen when companies in the same industry but different roles in a supply chain join forces. Amazon and Whole Food example above is a great example of vertical M&A. Conglomerate mergers and acquisitions happen when companies in different industries join their forces. Walt Disney Studios with Pixar, Lucasfilm, Disney, and Marvel is a great example of a conglomeration M&A with Walt Disney being the conglomerate and all the other companies being the subsidiary. 
Concentric mergers and acquisitions happen when two companies share consumer base but provide different services. An example of this is the merger between Coke and Vitamin Water. In 2007, Coke bought Vitamin Water as another option for consumers looking to purchase a non-soda beverage. At that time, Coke did not have any offerings for the non-soda drinking consumer. Coke was missing an entire market segment in the beverage consuming market. With the concentric merger, Coke was able to tap into a new stream of revenue by targeting a new customer segment in the beverage market using the vitamin, vitamin product, brand, image, etc. So why the heck is this important to an entrepreneur? Why is this even important to an individual running a podcast? Well, folks, here is the shades of entrepreneurship strategy, which gets to why this is important. My goal for the Shades of E is to have a network of podcasts in every state in the U.S. highlighting their local entrepreneurs using the brand called the Shades of Entrepreneurship, which is trademarked. I want to horizontally integrate with other podcasters and creators to establish the creatively insane conglomeration, podcasting, editing, video production, web design, etc. Creatively Insane LLC is the company. The Shades of Entrepreneurship, which is trademarked, is the subsidiary, the brand of Creatively Insane. Eventually, there will be other subsidies, assuming no pivots. And this is why it should be important to you too. I am not an expert in a lot of these fields, web design, video production. However, I am experienced in podcasting, constructing successful strategies, establishing and maintaining business relationships. These are areas I know I am good at. Exploring M&As as an entrepreneur is a way to address areas of weaknesses. And maybe weakness is too harsh of a word. Maybe vulnerabilities is more appropriate. But I hope to find leaders who want to collaborate in those areas of expertise with me. Areas I know I am not an expert in. And there you have it. That is a quick rundown of mergers and acquisitions. But don't take my word for it. Get out there. Network with some entrepreneurs. And who knows? Maybe you'll be talking about M&A in your future. Thank you, and I hope you enjoy this episode. Welcome to the Shades of Entrepreneurship, where we interview entrepreneurs to inspire the future entrepreneur. I'll be your host, Mr. Gabriel Flores. So grab a drink, sit back, Relax and enjoy the show. My next guest is an entrepreneur and tactical leader with more than 10 years' experience in regulating and emerging consumer product spaces. He is the current chief technology officer at Unrivaled. Please welcome Colin Landforce. Hello, everyone, and welcome to the Shades of Entrepreneurship. This is your host, Mr. Gabriel Flores. Today, I have a special guest, Colin Landforce. Colin, how are you doing, my good man? I'm so well. Thank you for chasing me down so we can finally do this. Oh, man, I'm excited because, yes, I, I will admit... I chased Colin down for several months because I really wanted to talk to him. I follow this gentleman on Twitter. He has a really good, if you guys don't check him out on Twitter, really good handle, really good insight. But today I really wanted to talk about unrivaled brands. But first I really want to introduce the world to Colin. So please Colin, introduce yourself to the listeners. You bet. Uh, you know, I'm never, never very good at this. I'm a serial entrepreneur. I'm based in Portland, which I think is where, uh, your podcast is generally based on our home community here. Um, I'm actually from Corvallis, about 90 miles south, and uh, was there until pretty much all the way through college. Been in Portland for 10 plus, maybe 11, 12 years now. Who's counting? And uh, for the last four or five years, I've been in uh, recreational cannabis. So um, today, what that looks like is is uh, retail in California production, cultivation, depending on how you want to talk about it, in California and Oregon, and distribution hubs in Portland, uh, the Bay Area, and Southern California. 
among other things. Um, so we, we've come a long way to get here. And of course, uh, as, as all good origin stories, it started, you know, in a, in a closet or a garage or uh, some version of that, depending on how you tell it. <laughs> so, so for the listeners at home, you mentioned you guys are a your cannabis brand, but what exactly is Unrivaled Brands? Yeah, we're a, so in the cannabis industry, the term MSO, multi-state operator, is used pretty commonly uh, to describe a company that has licenses and operations in multiple states since everything is completely fragmented. Um, uh, So we are a house of brands um, and an MSO, um, and we also are pretty focused on retail and bringing those brands directly to consumers, not just through our distribution channels. Um, We do our own distribution. Um, What's a good term? Like it's a necessary evil for us. And we also do some some third party brands. We are not, you know, a logistics or 3PL focused operation. Um, It just kind of came about. And here we are. So along with our own brands, Corova, Cabana and Sticks, we do some some key third parties that fit well into our overall portfolio. And, uh, and then, like I said, big focus for us is bringing those brands directly to consumers through retail. So earlier this summer, uh, we announced, actually, I guess late fall, depending on when this is happening, we announced acquisition of Peoples. Peoples is top three by revenue uh, in the state of California retail store. And if you are in Southern California, it's arguably the most visible retail store in Southern California. So it's a massive operation, thousand, thousand transactions a day. Um, and, uh, and we've got more people stores coming online. And so for us, it's that, that entire value chain from, from the seed, if you will, all the way through to the, the brand experience at retail with the end consumer. And yeah. So, so just for, to kind of break it down, just so I'm understanding it correctly, it's kind of like from the, from the growing the product to the selling of the product. Yeah, absolutely. And I think the, the, uh, uh, vertical integration, right, would be the, would be the term. But I think uh, a lot of a lot of folks are doing that. We are very very heavily brand focused. So like our indoor grows that we just recently turned on um, in uh, in California are really to to supply the Corova brand primarily. Um, we are we are brand first and uh, uh, really focused on on authentic cannabis brands that have been and will continue to be part of the culture. Nice. So how did, how did this concept get created? How did you start this? The origin story is, uh, like all good, um, (laughs) not all the origin story is flipping packs, right? Um, I think, uh, on, on several ends and from every angle, the origin story is selling, selling weed. And so in late medical and early recreational, that meant doing, uh, doing so to dispensaries, um, and, and selling bulk flour, selling, selling pounds. And uh, through that, we basically built out a network knowing that if we have a network of retailers that we serve, you kind of have an opportunity to, to serve them anything, if you will. And, uh, and that, that's where it began. Pre-rolls were the first place we went in terms of CPGs just because it's such a staple and it's such a coin toss if a pre-roll you buy in a dispensary is going to be any good. Uh, I think it still is today, and it certainly was four years ago or whatever it was. And so we really leaned into pre-rolls and figured out how to make really fantastic ones or perfect ones if you read our marketing material. And we've made millions of those. <laughs> we've, we've made millions of those since. And uh, our, our origin is, is a little bit convoluted if you back into it, right? Because about two years ago, we... Um, we did a merger with a, a California brand called Corova. I guess it's been two and a half years called Corova with a very similar, pretty similar origin story and footprint in California. And so uh, with, with that, all of a sudden we go from just Oregon to, um, to most of the West Coast and uh, scaling everything up from there. Yeah, you know, it's kind of funny. Before we did this, I, I sent, you know, I send my guests a list of questions like, hey, this is kind of the general summary. And I was like, hey, you know, you guys, LLC, S Corp, C Corp. And you're like, you know what? We're beyond that. We're, let's talk about mergers and acquisitions. And I was like, yeah, let's let's talk about merge. So let's let's dive into that a little bit. What are what are some things that you learned during the merger and acquisition f- f- kind of phase that young entrepreneurs should know about it? 
Well, I think it's kind of two pronged. First thing, I think integrations and uh, uh, anything of that nature are are super difficult just because of the humans involved, right? And so it's definitely a, a master ca- master class in communication um, and over communication, if you will, um, pulling pulling any project like that off. But I think that the the biggest light bulb that I think is probably underappreciated by by uh, uh, people that are interested in business or, or want to start a business and, and really a lot of entrepreneurs in general, certainly me three years ago, were that there's, there's a lot of ways to get into business and there's a lot of ways to, to grow business. And one of them is to go and buy them. And uh, a lot of times it's not nearly as simple as putting down the cash. And by that, I mean, I mean that in a good way and that you don't need to have a million dollars sitting in a bank account to go buy a business for a million dollars. And that kind of opens up a whole new world, again, in terms of starting something, if you're not currently doing something now and, and want to get into X, Y, or Z, as well as uh, growing a business, right? If you want to grow from $100,000 a year to a million dollars a year, you can sell 10 times as many of your widgets, uh, or you can acquire your way into that, or do something in the middle, which I think is probably the the um, highest leverage thing you can do in that go and, and buy something um, you know, maybe that gets you halfway there, but has a lot of low hanging fruit that you think you can easily um, crank up into into that mark. So I think there's a, a whole new world that, again, for me personally, was not on my radar three years ago um, and, and uh, is only now becoming more popular. I think a lot of what you see on Twitter, I would imagine, is is around uh, uh, acquisition of, of small of SMB, small and medium businesses and and everything around that. It's getting hot, but there's still a lot on the table. Yeah. And you know, one of the things you also mentioned was financing, you know, and going through that process because there's, there's different ways you mergers, mergers and acquisitions and financing. How did you start your funding? Was it grassroots? Was it venture capital? How did you go about starting your business? Yeah, we're bootstrapped from the beginning. And, uh, that included a little bit of friends and family, uh, our business at its core, especially back then was very low margin and very cash intensive. So it was a bit of a nightmare on that front. Um, uh, it's very easy to just eat cash, even, even if you're profitable, um, when you're, you're doing something that is, you know, 10, 20% margin, which like I called out, uh, uh, selling bulk, bulk flour is. And, uh, so for us, we were bootstrapped until, uh, that first round of M&A that I mentioned uh, that came along with uh, some capital infusion from uh, our former CEO, uh, now board member, uh, that, that put the deal together and brought those companies together. And then now, as of July, we are uh, a public equity. We're traded on the OTCQX. And so, you know, again, a whole nother chapter and a whole nother uh, frontier. So that that's pretty cool. So you're now a public trading company. Yes. That is awesome. That is, how did, how does, what's that process like? Uh, so we got there, there's a hundred ways to get there. I think we, we got there through a merger with an existing cannabis company. Um, so actually one, one of the, one of the first, uh, companies to, to go publicly traded early on in cannabis and long before recreational. So for us, it was a, a uh, stock swap, a 50, 50, or like, you know, 51 point yada, yada, um, a, a 50, 50 merger, um, to bring us onto the public market and into, uh, their vehicle and assets and everything in between. Wow. That's cool. Now the, the cannabis industry in itself is, is really new, right? Like it's Oregon, maybe been legal, what, five years or something like that. Seven years. I'm not, not exactly sure. So right. how difficult has it been, you know, to start a business in an emerging market? I mean, this is a brand new market. I think 90%, maybe that's overstating it, 80% of what we do is widgets on trucks into retail and selling them to customers. Um, that being said, that last 20% that is cannabis specific, cannabis specific is pretty, can, certainly can be pretty nuanced and intensive. So um, the, the highest impact thing, especially early on, was just no access to things that most businesses take take for granted, right? Like running payroll and having to do it in cash. Um, Or even just the the luxury of like your payroll system calculates that it should be $932.87. 
um, versus when paychecks won't have you. You a you don't get to have them doing all your your uh, uh, calculations for you, but then you also have to go and scrounge together the the dimes and nickels and pennies, right? So access to like basic business services, uh, particularly early on, uh, we still deal with it now. But there's there's entire industries built around serving us at this point, albeit in a limited or uh, you know always an asterisk on pretty much everything fashion, but. Um, yeah, I think the, the financial and banking side and speaking to the, uh, you know, the fundraising and, and capital side of it, a lot of small businesses, particularly when, when we were a small business could go to the bank and, and, uh, borrow working capital. And that was of course an absolute non-starter when we were drug dealers. Gotcha. Yeah. Yeah. And you know, that's, that's an important point for the listeners at home is since this industry is not federally approved, it's not legally federally you can't get any federal loans and like federal assistance and federal support. So it's really on the state level. And when Colin's talking about, you know, financing on these different businesses that kind of have been established, these businesses are also in emerging markets because <laughs> what they're doing is pretty new and novel. And, and they do have a lot of asterisks. It sounds like next to them. What would you say, you know, throughout the process of, especially in this business in particular has been easy or has there any, been anything easy? Uh, no, it's been brutally difficult. Honestly, it's it's as with a lot of industries that are like uh, considered cool and interesting, right? Whether it's some uh, tech thing or AI, I think all of that is like brutally difficult. And I don't mean to conflate, you know, uh, cannabis CPG to artificial intelligence, but it's brutally competitive. Um, uh, the regulators don't even have it figured out, uh, and it changes every day. Yeah. Now this isn't your first business you said too, correct? Yeah, I mean I'm I'm kind of a lifelong serial entrepreneur and dabbler. So before I was doing what has become unrivaled, um, I was on a tear doing uh, freelance consulting, like growth consulting, um, in the restricted consumer goods space. So in medical devices, skincare, firearms, uh, and uh, uh, consumer drones. Um, and I think that the common thread there is kind of like having to tiptoe around the rules, rules or work around the rules. And, uh, it was kind of a perfect setup for cannabis, which of course is like a, a much more stringent set of rules, but, uh, similar, similar, all the same and that you can't just do the run of the mill, uh, run of the run of the mill playbook by any means. Yeah. Yeah. It's, 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 it's very novel, you know, still new. In fact, I think just recently, if, if I recall, I think it was just like today or the other day. They actually found a, a field cultivating there in Southern Oregon, about a hundred million dollars worth that they just randomly stumbled upon. So for your industry, is it difficult because you're still having to kind of compete against the the illegal distributors versus the legal? Um, I think there, there's a lot to unpack there. I think the biggest the biggest element of that is that. If you are doing legal recreational cannabis, you are restricted to the market that you're licensed in. Whereas the illegal, the black market, the traditional market, as it's called, uh, can ship it anywhere, <laughs> right? So the state, uh, the states have direct control over how much supply there's going to be. They, uh, they are the ones that license folks. So really, both in in Oregon and California right now, we're uh, for the second time in Oregon and for the first time in a big way in California, we are seeing the, the side effects of over-licensing producers and what that does to the market because it, it absolutely floods the market with great products that can't go anywhere, right? Whereas those illegal grows that you're seeing are obviously not in place to go and sell, um, sell cannabis in downtown Portland or otherwise they're there to go sell, sell it uh, into the rest of the country. Um, which, which just means that the illegal folks don't have rules to play by and the legal recreational have really rules that really cripple you from a supply demand perspective, right? Like there are, there are no options for people that are sitting on a bunch of weight, um, and market prices that are half what they were planned on. Wow. Yeah. And, and that's, that's, I correct me if I'm wrong, but even though another state has legalized it, you still can't go state to state, correct? Yeah, absolutely. The, the, uh, 
obviously the tracking systems are totally independent. <clears throat> I think one of the trickier parts that's probably overlooked is that the compliance and things like labeling and packaging are also independent. One of the trickier parts of what we do is the the similar but different elements of all the components for all of our product lines. Um, you know, even even the exact same SKU, take a eighth of an eighth of, of Corova flour, which you can buy up and down the West Coast in Oregon and California. Um, even that, the the uh, jar isn't quite the same. The label isn't quite the same. It looked pretty similar, and you may or may not notice it as a consumer. But for the uh, the back end team uh, operating the supply chain, it's it's not even close. And really, it doesn't matter how close it is if it's not the same. Yeah, in- interesting. It's, it's it's just it's baffling to me still that there's so many different. It's like there are different rules for every state, and it it just yeah, kind of yeah. there's no cohesion behind it. Particularly that you know each new state is probably looking at other states, but generally making it up um, as if as if other states haven't figured out some of these things or or just figured out what was overlooked, right? Like uh, our license type, uh, especially early on, was a distribution license type or a wholesale license type rather. And when the first Oregon rules rolled out, they had a bunch of rules for retailers. They had a bunch of rules for growers and for processors and labs and wholesalers were almost overlooked. Um, And so you had these entire like huge gaps in the rules that just nobody had really sat down and thought about the place that the wholesaler plays in the supply chain. And just like if any of these things made sense, Um, which of course, plenty of them, plenty of them didn't. But I think that's the nature of what we do, and it's it's what we signed up for ultimately. Yeah, I mean, it's like you we mentioned, you know, it's kind of an emerging market, so there's a lot of new surprises. Everybody's kind of learning as they go kind of thing, it seems. Now, now you mentioned you've been a serial entrepreneur for some time. What are some things that have surprised you so far in business? Maybe it's in, in the cannabis industry or maybe just in business in general that when you kind of came into becoming an entrepreneur that you didn't really expect I think cash is a very elusive and mysterious thing uh, for a lot of businesses. And that seems ridiculous to say <clears throat> on the surface, but cash flow is is very, very difficult to get a hold of um, for a lot of businesses. And for some, it's really simple and it's a non-issue, but it's, it's very, very difficult to manage in a detailed way. And uh, uh, for a lot of businesses that are, are lower margin, managing it and uh, having enough of it are just absolutely critical. And it's, uh, it's a, it's a lot cash flow, cash is king. I think that truer words never, never spoke. Yeah, no, I, I, I completely agree. I'm, I'm, you know, been running this podcast for some time and I always think of, you know, think of your financial reservoir as a, as a, as a reservoir, as a lake, right? You don't want your lake to dry up. So you need to figure out different ways. How are you going to fill up that lake with different cash streams, right? How are these little streams are going to trickle into your lake? And so that's what I'm also thinking like, hey, how can we continue to make revenue so we can continue to produce some amazing things, right? Now, what advice would you give for an entrepreneur that's maybe interested in joining the cannabis industry or or just joining, becoming a small business owner themselves? Yeah, so on the cannabis front, that's an easy one and it is don't. And there's a, there's an, there's an asterisk on that. And I say that just because it's, it's brutally competitive. And like most of the people that want to get into cannabis want to get into cannabis because they like cannabis, which is fine, but that's not a good reason to get into a brutally competitive, you know, early stage industry that, uh, that has a ton of unknown. But what I would do, uh, and I, I did a thread about this and this is the advice I pretty consistently give is there is so much room to do uh, business services services that are niched into the cannabis industry. So picks and shovels around cannabis. Um, And, and it's literally anything. You could be a, a contractor, you'd be an electrician, a marketing agency, anything that serves a normal business niched into cannabis is a massive opportunity. And, um, and there are also the folks that get paid, right? When, when things are rough and you're a grower, you can't not pay the electrician, right? Otherwise he doesn't come and get your power running. Um, and, uh, so I, I think the biggest opportunity in cannabis is for 
non-cannabis, non-plant touching, as they say, ancillary businesses, the picks and shovels of the industry. And I don't think I'm the, the first person to have that revelation. I'm sure you're familiar with the, uh, the, the phrase. I can't remember the exact phrase, but uh, the, the gold miners did not get rich. The Levi Strauss and Wells Fargo and American Express of the world got rich and they were there to serve those people. That's very, very true. That's very true. Now, what, what should young entrepreneurs watch out for when they're starting their own business? You, you kind of mentioned some of the things, you know, being cash and, and cash flow and, and those things. What are some other good things that they should be kind of mindful of? What a broad question. I might need a second to think on this one. Sorry. Um, uh, I think that, I think that people are uh, the gift and the curse, right? So people are obviously your most important asset, and they uh, they can also be your your biggest crush. And so the 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 biggest takeaway I have from that is just to act decisively. You know, uh, I think it can be uh, managing people is difficult, and leading people is difficult, and it can be really easy to you know identify a problem or or decide that something's not working out and then just deal with it for <clears throat> months or, or longer, really. And I think that the, the ability to address, uh, address, have that confrontation, address the conflict, is uh, a bit of a superpower uh, in entrepreneurship. And, uh, and really, if you, if you boil down to it, if you're sitting there and you've got somebody that isn't a good fit for what you're trying to do, you're doing them a disservice by keeping them in it as well. So while that conversation may be painful and laying someone off or letting someone go is, is never any fun, if it's not a big picture solution for everybody, you're really doing somebody a disservice by keeping them in that spot and, and really uh, helping them go and find their next chapter is, is the best thing for everybody. So I think, I think acting with decisiveness and, and candor on with, with your people is, is critical. And uh, yeah. You know, looking back on everything, coming back from, uh, you know, living small town Oregon and up to Portland, doing Unrivaled Brand, what advice would you give a younger Colin? Can you say that again? Sorry. You know, I'm not really big on, maybe not, maybe regret isn't the word, but I think that everything that I've done to this point is like a critical part of me sitting in the chair that I'm sitting in right now and doing what I'm doing right now. So I'm not sure that I would have any d advice because that would potentially, you know, uh, that could potentially keep me from learning something that I learned myself by experiencing it. Um, uh, that being said, I think I, I study not study is probably not the right word. I read a lot of stoicism and it's in, in modern stoicism and, and Ryan Holiday's books in particular uh, after the source material. And I think ego plays a huge role in everyone's life. And um, so that said, uh, I think that uh, figuring that out earlier would probably uh, create less pain for everybody involved and, and really figuring out how to understand that and control that. But generally speaking, I can't say that enough. Like I've, I've, I think on the surface wasted a lot of time or what if I had just done it this way from the beginning? Everyone's had those moments. I'm no different. Um, but I think they're just a core part of, of getting from A to B. So I'm not sure that I would uh, make any recommendations to prevent them, if that makes sense. No, I like it. I actually love that answer. And in fact, that's not the first time I think I've had guests on this because I ask that question often. You know, we we are kind of our past, right? Um, you know, we have two eyes in the front, not in the back to look towards our future, not back on our past kind of thing. Uh, and I, I, I like, I like, you know, the folks kind of come on here and like, you know, this, it's what made me, you know, <laughs> the past made me. Yeah. I mean, and it's, it's not just a line, right? It, I mean, it, it, like, that's the deal that, that is in fact how you become who you are and get where you're going to go. So if you didn't have it, it would just be different. Maybe no one's, to say whether it'd be better or worse, it'd be different. And so if you like where you're at, then well. Yes, I like it. So so for the folks at home, how can they support Unrivaled Brands? How can they get the products? Where are you at in the social media world and the web pages? Let the world know where they can find some more information. Yeah, so myself personally, I'm doing the Twitter thing, as you called out. So 
uh, Land Force, L-A-N-D-F-O-R-C-E, is my real last name, and it's also my handle on the interwebs. So at Land Force is me. And in terms of for us, so if you're in Oregon, we are all over. Well, I guess if you're in Oregon or California, we're all over the place. Um, it's pretty likely that the shop down the street has uh, our brands, Corova, Sticks, Cabana are the big brands. Uh, they, we've got SKUs in every category kind of spread out across those brands. It's probably a different podcast to talk about all the shelves that we are filling up, uh, but we're all over the place. And then, uh, like we talked about, we were publicly traded, so we're not in Robinhood or Webull, unfortunately. But uh, uh, any any brokerage account, like any Schwab account, you can buy our stock, and I have no advice around that. But uh, if you like what we're doing, that is certainly a great way to uh, support us and get involved in it. I like it, and I'm, I will admit I am not a financial advisor either, but get off of Robinhood. Amen. Come delete your Robinhood account. <laughs> Come on, man. Get, find Fidelity. Get over to Webull. Find something good for that. <laughs> Let's just delete that one. <laughs> man, Colin, thank you so much for your time. I really do appreciate it. Uh, I, so much good information today. Really cool brand. Really cool what you guys are doing. I'm really excited to kind of see you guys grow. Thank you for tuning in to the Shades of Entrepreneurship. For more information, please follow the Shades of E on Twitter, Instagram, Facebook, or visit theshadesofe.com.